Um, I'm here today with uh, Dr. Luigi Nudi, who is the head of the metabolic unit in the cardiovascular division at uh, King's College. Um, Dr. Nudi's research uh, revolves around understanding mechanisms of vascular permeability, and he's very much interested in protecting these vessels from the deleterious effects of risk factors such as hypertension and um, in an attempt to avoid, for example, um, um, kidney disease. So I'm, I'm very grateful that Dr. Newley had found the time to join us today. And I would like, um, if that would, is, would be possible, uh, Dr. Newley, to perhaps expand on some of the issues that you raised in your in interesting talk earlier uh, today. Uh, one of the points that I would like you to tell us a little bit more about is about albu albuminuria. Is albuminuria just a biomarker of kidney disease? Is it a marker of cardiovascular risk? And how does it, why is it a marker of these two conditions? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, it's a good opportunity that you ask because it's really a, a crucial point in today's research. And uh, certainly, uh, many investigators are looking for microalbuminuria to be a surrogate marker for cardiovascular disease, uh, kidney disease, and actually I don't think we're there yet. Uh, a kind of measuring microalbuminuria doesn't mean that we're measuring a kidney which we will fail in the future, or an individual who has a propensity to develop an MI or stroke or any cardiovascular event. Uh, I think, uh, uh, why is this? Uh, uh, I think it may be intrinsic in the mechanism uh, or maybe we need to do more work and study more patients and look more into the mechanism. Uh, I think there is quite a strong evidence that if we speak about macroalbuminuria, that's certainly a marker, a surrogate marker for renal disease. There's no question about that. Now, is albuminuria, micro or macro, a surrogate for a cardiovascular? No. But I think uh, that Endothelial dysfunction per se, as I was mentioning in the, in the talk, is a common pathway to both cardiovascular disease, vessel damage, etc., and the damage into the vessel of the kidney, which then become permeable and then uh, clinically present as albuminuria in our patients. So, for the moment, I think remains a marker, just a marker, not a surrogate marker, I think still we can use it to have a, an idea of the patient sitting in front of us. Uh, I'm still using that as a target for treatment to try to reduce it and I'll explain in my presentation just now why and potential reason, but there's probably more um, work to do and studies to answer more questions that are still unanswered okay. today. In the context of hypertension, somebody with albuminuria or microalbuminuria, will necessarily have endothelial dysfunction? Are these two things measuring different events, similar events? It's a redundant sort of thing, measuring yeah. endothelial dysfunction and microalbuminuria? Microalbuminuria, albuminuria in general, depends a lot on blood pressure. That's the point. I reduce blood pressure, I will improve albuminuria quite a lot. Not in all patients, of course, but uh, that's why really is not a surrogate mark. But, uh, uh, and certainly correcting blood pressure does not correct endothelial dysfunction unless I use specific drugs that target specific pathways. Um, so, um, again, endothelial dysfunction as a core, I think, of all these processes and different readout and marker or surrogate marker that we can use. Um. Is, is in, in, the, in, I mean, your, in your uh, unit for metabolic medicine, uh, certainly diabetes plays a significant role. I mean, it's, it's certainly one of the targets of your, of your research. Would it be reasonable to assume that diabetes is an inflammatory condition per se? Yes, and this idea was initially proposed actually guys by Professor Pickup, still working with us uh, currently. Uh, yes, the diabetes is a 
systemic inflammatory disease. There's a million of different cytokines. It's an inflammatory process at the vessel level, the tissue levels are ongoing. If you look at the kidney, which has many expertise, and if you take biopsies or if you take uh, uh, hum humans, animal models, we see an infiltrate of lymphomonocytes uh, early in the history of the disease. So really, inflammation is key, and uh, it's at the basis of the then the, the, the complication, the vascular complication, then then develops. For and inflammation time. and um, endothelial dysfunction actually go hand go in hand. Them. So, so that's the, I mean, measuring endothelial dysfunction in that condition actually gives important clues to the clinician as to how advanced the process, the vascular abnormality is. I suppose that we would be reasonable to assume that. Yes, uh, yes, indeed, indeed, and. Uh, Indeed, there are, for example, just a brief note on PPA gamma agonists, which are a uh, very interesting drug. We lost one uh, recently because of uh, side effects or whatever regulation, but uh, uh, PPA gamma agonists are not only potent oral hypoglycemic agents, but potent anti-inflammatory agents. And there is an independent effect of these drugs, uh, in, sorry, a metabolic independent effect of these drugs on inflammation per se, and so right. these have been shown to be quite good in terms of albuminuria per se, for example, right. or right. Uh, right. intima media thickness and right. etc. All parameters that we look in the in our patient when we assess vascular disease. Right. And recently, the attention has actually focused on uh, the adipocyte, sort of initially considered to be a sort of just a reservoir for fat and inert cell. Now has become an important it's an system. important it's an important issue yes maybe neglected in the past it's important metabolically uh, it is important for what it does there is it has been proposed uh, adipocyte vascular axis adipose tissue it's around vessels and it produces many cytokines again and again it's a balance between inflammatory cytokines and i was mentioning tnf alpha interleukin 6 and other cytokines, such as an adiponectin, which instead, in the, on the contrary, than the inflammatory one, which are sort of, sort of bad, adiponectin is good. And it protects the, the vessel and is uh, anti, in a way, endothelial dysfunction. Uh, recently, there has been some interesting work by Sharma looking at uh, adiponectin knockout animals and proteinuria. And again, adiponectin is seems quite important at the level of the glomerular filtration barrier, in the telium, protocytes, in uh, regulating the permeability to protein. I think the story is still uh, in its early days because if you look at the clinical observation, proteinuria, uh, albuminuria, and uh, diponectin, they don't go always together in the same direction, but I think it's a quite stimulating, fascinating aspect that we need to expand and uh, maybe it will lead to some new interesting treatment to help the patients, right. and we need uh, those. For, for, for the people who have actually registered in the course and are interested in understanding um, why endothelial dysfunction should be measured or whether we should measure endothelial function to see whether there, are, there is an impairment, from your perspective as an expert basic scientist and also a clinician, what would be the role that you would assign to measuring endothelial function in the clinical arena? Well, in the clinical setting, if we want to have uh, an idea of what's happening to the vessel of our patient, we need something easy to measure, cheap and fast. Uh, we have, for example, albuminuria. That's why it was successful. Uh, it's cheap. You can do it anywhere, everywhere, anytime. Uh, endothelial dysfunction is maybe a touch cumbersome but in a selected number, I think, well, I think there are many other parameters, cytokines or circulating factors that we can measure, uh, CRP protein, for example, that can give us really an idea of the status of the, of the vascular status of the patients. Uh, measuring endothelial dysfunction per se with the classical methods maybe is just for the moment to be limited into research. Well, thank you very much for taking thank the time you, to speak to, to, to me. It's been fascinating listening to your talk and also listening to what you just told us. Thank you very much. Thank you.